peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And they say, there you go. So you have to be holy in order to be able to see the Lord. Okay. Is holiness, sanctification, change in moral behavior necessary for final salvation? Yes. And that's, do you think that's underplayed? I mean, I agree totally. What yeah. Would you go to a text? I mean, the, the one that people usually go to is in Hebrews, without holiness, you will not see the face of God. You know, the, yeah, the writer of the Hebrews says, you know, without holiness, no one's going to see God. And, and uh, but that's where it's salvation. No, it's not. This is your classic, you know, non-saved interpretation of the Bible where they take anything, holiness, salvation, and they just apply it. Any, any word that maybe insinuates salvation, and they just apply it to salvation, just period. This is, has nothing to do with salvation. Look at verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth, doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So when the Bible talks about to, be in, to live in holiness, follow peace and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, it's referring to what we see in verse number two. Because in order for us to look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, what do we have to do? We have to lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. So in order for us to look into Jesus as our example to continue in this race, we need to make sure that we're repenting of our sin. Not for salvation, right? This is so we can finish our race that is set before us. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So obviously we understand that in the uh, end times of the book of Revelation, we see that there is one Antichrist that will arise, right? That will deceive the whole world. But the Bible's telling us here that even now, whether it's in John's day or in our day, there are many Antichrists. Verse 19, they, who's they? Just like the person who was in church who thought they believed? Is that it? No. They is referring to the Antichrists. They went out from us. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Oh, no, no, that's referring to the person who says he believes, but then he goes out into the world and starts fornicating and drinking. No, it's saying that it's referring to the Antichrist. Who are they? These are wicked, false, reprobate teachers, prophets, right? Who are, the Bible says that their folly shall be made manifest. And when their folly is made manifest, they went out from us. Because we don't tolerate false prophets, amen? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So they'll take that right there and say, see, believing is not enough to be saved. You also have to endure to the end, they say. One of the necessary marks of saving faith is that it endures to the end. The faith that saves is a faith that endures to the end. A faith that does not endure to the end is not saving faith. Now, if you just took that verse by itself, you could make it teach that, right? But what's the chapter about? What's the context? The chapter is about the end of the world. It says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, and then he starts to teach on that. So what's the chapter about? What is the sign of his coming? And what's the sign of the end of the world? Did they go up to him and say, hey, Jesus, tell us how we can get saved. How do we get to heaven? How do we get eternal life? Is that what they're saying? This is about end times Bible prophecy. And when it says, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This is not at all about being saved in the sense of going to heaven. It's about being saved physically, as in not dying. Look, if you would, at Matthew 24, verse 22, just a few verses down. Let's get some context. It says, and except those days should be shortened, there should no what? Flesh, Flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So if you actually study the chapter, we're not talking about the salvation of the soul. What are we talking about? Your flesh being saved, meaning physical salvation. It's like when Peter was drowning and he said, Lord, save me. He wasn't saying, Lord, I want to go to heaven. 
He's saying, Lord, pull me out of the water. So saved here is not talking about going to heaven. It's talking about being physically spared death, your flesh being saved. It's talking about survival. That's it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, a lot of people will look at this and say, see, if you keep sinning, grace won't abound. Is that what it says? Back up two verses to Romans 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So if you get the context, he's saying, if we continue in sin, grace will abound. Meaning we're not going to lose our salvation. The more sins we commit, the more is forgiven of God. But then he says, hey, should we do that? God forbid that anyone would take their salvation and say, well, now that I'm saved, And no matter what I do, I'm going to heaven. I'm just going to go out and continue in sin. And of course, if you do that, the Bible's real clear. God's going to punish you right. on this earth. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So the Bible's real clear here that once we are God's sons and daughters, that we have eternal life, we have everlasting life. If we continue in sin, grace will abound. But should we? Continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid. We should do what's right. We should go to church. We should read our Bibles. We should serve him. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is speaking to believers. There's no question about it. Because if we get the context leading into it, he talks about people being saved. The verses that we just read in verse 16, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And then he says, where remission of these is, talking about the remission of sins, there is no more offering for sins. Earlier in this chapter, he talked about the fact that they used to continually bring sin offerings and trespass offerings, but that now Jesus Christ is the lamb slain once for all, one sacrifice for all of our sins that doesn't need to keep being offered, but was just offered one time. And it's just, it's a done deal. Verse 21, having a high priest over the house of God. Earlier in the book of Hebrews, he explained that that high priest in the New Testament is Jesus. It's not Aaron. It's not the sons of Aaron. It's not Caiaphas or Annas. It's Jesus Christ himself. He is our high priest. And the Bible says, because we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. What is he referring to there? When he talks about our hearts being sprinkled, that's because in the Old Testament, he sprinkled the blood on the people when the tabernacle was consecrated. He said, we weren't sprinkled physically, but our hearts were sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, look, now that we're saved, now that we're washed, he says, now let's consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. He says, provoke each other to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching, look at the first word of verse 26, for, for means because it's a conjunction. If we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Notice it says, for if we, we who've had our our sins forgiven and remitted and have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ if we sin willfully. Now, a lot of people will misunderstand that. And when it says there were made no more sacrifice for sins, people will think, oh, that means Jesus' sacrifice is not applicable. No, that's not what he's saying. 
When he says there's no more sacrifice for sins, it's basically the same statement that he was making back in verse 18 at the end there when he said there's no more offering for sin. Okay, He's saying that if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, we don't have the animal sacrifice where we offer a sin offering and everything's fine. But instead of a sacrifice for sins, there's a certain, verse 27, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. This is somebody who's been saved. An unholy thing, and it done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. A lot of people see the words punishment, judgment, fiery indignation. What's fiery indignation? It's anger. Okay, fiery anger is what that is. It's not saying you're going to the fires of hell. It says fiery indignation. And if we go back to the scripture in Numbers 15 and put it side by side with Hebrews 10, you will see how clear it is that God is talking about punishing his children, chastening his children when they sin willfully. It says in verse 24, Then it shall be, if aught be committed by ignorance, without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering, for a sweet savor unto the Lord, with his meat offering and his drink offering, according to the manner, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance. Look, you mess up, you do something wrong, and it comes to your knowledge, and you realize, I've made a mistake here. I've done wrong. Then what do you do? You take the animal to the priest, and you offer a burnt sacrifice as an atonement for your sin, and it'll be forgiven you. This isn't talking about salvation. This isn't talking about your entrance into heaven by bringing an animal. The Bible says it's not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sins. Right. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. It's salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not by making an offering. You don't buy your way into heaven with the fat of rams and, and, and lambs and so forth. But this, you say, well, then what was the purpose of the animal sacrifices? Here was the purpose. To repair the relationship between you and God. You've done wrong. God's going to cloud up and rain on you. But when you come to him, with an offering and make a peace offering, a trespass offering, a sin offering, you come to him and you're showing that you're sorry and you're making things right with God. And then when you bring that animal, then God will forgive you for that. Okay. And again, we're not talking about salvation. Salvation is a one-time thing. But we're, aren't we constantly confessing our sins to God as believers? And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what we're talking about here in this passage. He shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. It's saying that if you just willfully, presumptuously, defiantly go out, and say, it's not through ignorance, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't just a slip up, but you just go out and defy the word of the Lord, the Bible says, you don't just bring an offering and just fix that. He says, no, you're exiled, you're cut off from among the people, you're, you're basically expelled from the children of Israel. You're not allowed to dwell among them, okay? That's what he means when he says that they'll be cut off from among his people. And then look at verse 31. Because he hath despised the word of the Lord. Now, that's exactly the word that was used in Hebrews 10. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That's what this is referring back to here. When it says, hey, they've despised the word of the Lord if they've sinned presumptuously. In verse 31, it says, because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron, unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall be surely put to death 
All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. This guy, according to the Bible, despised the word of the Lord. That's what the Bible, because when Hebrews 10 says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses, it's specifically talking about this guy. Because look at the passage. It's about people sinning presumptuously versus sinning through ignorance, not being able to make an offering for their sin anymore and having despised the word of the Lord. That's all the same stuff in Hebrews 10. That's why it says in verse 31, he despised the word of the Lord. And then it gives the example of the guy who despised God's word and he dies without mercy under two or three witnesses. That's what the Bible is showing us in Hebrews chapter 10. Not talking about personal salvation, going to heaven or hell, but it's talking about God's people not defying God and despising his word. It says, wherefore my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, if you just pull this out of context and you just throw this at somebody and say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, what does it sound like? They have to do good works to go to heaven. That's what they do with James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. Therefore, they pull that out of context and then they throw it at you and say, you got to do good works to go to heaven. So, what's this talking about? Well, you know, go back to chapter 1 because, uh, you know, if you get into chapter 2, it's probably assumed that you read chapter 1. You know, that gives you a lot of context as far as what's, talk, what's being talked about here. Paul's writing this letter to the Philippians. And if you remember, where, where's the most famous passage that we go to about soul winning? Where was Paul at when it talks about what must I do to be saved? Where was he at? He was at Philippi. They were put in prison because they were preaching the gospel. And so when you're dealing with the Philippians and when he says work out your own salvation, what he's talking about, I'm just going to say straight, straight up what he's talking about, physical salvation. Okay, just keep that in mind when you're reading this. Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 it says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So he's basically saying, listen, I want you to understand that the things that have happened to me right now, they're for the furtherance of the gospel. Because he's going to explain what has happened to them. Verse 13, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So he's in bonds. As he's writing this letter, he's in chains, he's in prison. And it says in verse 14, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So is it pretty clear that he's in bonds, that he's in prison? Because he said that many times. And what he's stating here is that, Listen, I'm in bonds, but a lot of the brethren see that and it emboldens them. They see someone in prison for the cause of Christ and they say, hey, I want to go do that. Notice what he says now. This is the key because we were talking about in chapter 2 where it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why would he say that to the Philippians? Because he's going through it too. It says in verse 19, for I know that this shall turn to my what? Salvation. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now, did he say that he's going to be magnified in his spirit or his soul? No, he says in his body. We're talking about physical salvation. And he says that I know this shall turn to my salvation. Now, was Paul worried about him going to heaven or not? Now, he's, he's, he says in 2 Corinthians, I am confident, willing, rather, to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. And actually, right after this, he says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it says, I am in a straight betwixt two, for I have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. It's not like he's worried about, oh, am I going to go to heaven or I'm going to go to hell? No, he's talking about physical salvation. And he says, let it be. You know, because whether by life or by death, my body will be magnified unto the Lord. He, he goes from himself talking about, hey, I know this shall turn to my salvation. I'm in bonds. I'm, you know, suffering persecution for Christ right now. But then he turns it to them and he says, having the same conflict. So he's telling them, you had the same conflict, which he saw in me and now here to be in me. Well, how, how does that make sense? Well, they were there at Philippi when he was put into prison. 
Remember when we said, you know, when the Philippian jailer came up to him, what must I do to be saved? They saw that, and now they're also hearing that it's in him because he's telling them that, hey, I'm in bonds, you know, and telling this whole story about how he's in bonds right now, but it's to the furtherance of the gospel. But he's saying, you have the same conflict because you have adversaries. And so then you go into chapter 2, and you go into chapter 2, and it, and it starts giving... Uh, talking about the fact of the fellowship and all that stuff, but it's really talking about, it goes into Christ and saying that he was in the form of God, but he thought that not robbery would be equal to God, was made of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and it says he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Paul is giving him an example saying, I'm going through afflictions, I, you know, I know this shall turn to my salvation, because I have confidence that God's going to deliver me out of this, but... You had that same conflict, and don't forget that Jesus went to the cross. That Jesus, you know, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, but God highly exalted him. And, you know, when it talks about working out your own salvation, what you got to understand is that we're all, you know, we're all here in a congregation. We all, we're all here together, right? But we're not always that way. Right? There, there's times where you're going to be on your own. That's why each and every single Christian needs to be able to stand on their own. That's why you need to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You need to be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And isn't that what it says with this? It says, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. And what's interesting about that phrase, and when it says fear and trembling, or meekness and fear, it's always applying to Christians serving God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So you need to remember who God is. God is love. But he's also a consuming fire. He's also a man of war. So we know that we should fear God, have reverence and godly fear to God. But in verse 6 of the next chapter it says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So notice that. Right? We're not supposed to fear what man can do unto us, but we are supposed to fear God. So would it make any sense that we're supposed to be fearing man in that passage where it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? No. It wouldn't make any sense because constantly saying, don't fear man, don't fear man, don't fear man. Don't fear what flesh can do unto you, right? And he's constantly saying that over and over again. So who are we fearing? God. And we know that this shall turn to our salvation according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, you know, I may magnify Christ in my body, whether it be by life or by death. You know, that's the, that's the mentality we should have when we're in those situations, right? So don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's going to be times that you're going to be on your own and you're going to have to deal with it yourself. Someone's going to ask you a question about what you believe and you're going to have to deal with it yourself. And you're going to have to have the answer yourself. And that's where you need to trust in God and know that He's with you and get through those trials and tribulations. They'll try to take this verse to say, hey, in order to, in order to be saved, you have to be sad. And they'll say, you know, if you're not sad and crying or sorrowful or, or whatever, you know, you didn't really get saved. There had, they say you have to be under conviction and you got to be broken and you got to be, you know, sad and have a sorrow and whatever. And you realize sin is exceedingly sinful. It'll bring tears to your heart. That's the way of genuine repentance. Godly sorrow works repentance. And when someone doesn't understand the exceeding sinfulness of sin which comes by the moral law, the Ten Commandments, he won't have godly sorrow, he won't have repentance, he won't say it's necessary for salvation. All he says is, just got to believe, just got to believe. And this is what the verse they use, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, if you actually get the context here, he is talking, the Apostle Paul, to the leadership of the church at Corinth about the fact that they had to throw a guy out of church for committing fornication. And when they got Paul's letter about throwing the guy out of church, the letter made them sad. The letter made them sorry. And Paul said, you know what? I'm glad that I made you sorry. I'm glad you were sad. Why are you glad that we're sad? 
Well, I'm glad that you are sad because godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. So the context is not about unsaved people getting saved. It's about people that are already saved. In fact, they're even pastors and deacons of the church. They're leaders. And they were sad when they got Paul's letter. And so it caused them to repent of what? Repent of allowing fornication to exist in their church. They got it straightened out. They threw the guy out. You see, again, this is an example of salvation not referring to going to heaven. Lots of times in the Bible, salvation is referring to being saved from this. Like when the Bible says that women will be saved in childbearing. It's not saying, oh, you had a baby, you're going to heaven. <laughs> what kind of nonsense is that? Yeah. But that's the kind of logic that people use when they take things out of context. But look what he says in verse number eight. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Do you notice how... Verses 9 and 11 are both talking about them being sad about throwing that guy out of church and getting Paul's letter. So why would verse 10 just be about something totally different? All of a sudden, verse 10 is a soul winning verse? So all these, first of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about this same situation. 1 Corinthians 5 talks about this situation. And right here in chapter 7, we see verse number 8, verse number 9, verse number 11, verse number 12. It's all about that situation. Why would verse 10 just be a soul winning verse plugged in? Hey, make sure they cry. Make sure they're sad. Make sure they're really sorry for their sins. No, no, you don't have to sorrow to be saved. Last time I checked, the gospel was good news. And a lot of people, when they hear the gospel, they don't get sad. They don't sorrow. They rejoice. Amen. But, you know, we need to get off this thing of making salvation this emotional experience. It's not an emotional experience. It's about... Believe in the gospel. It's about faith. It's not about emotion. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence. Notice that exact same term, give diligence from back in verse five, where he said, beside this, giving all diligence, add to faith virtue. He says, wherefore the rather, rather than forgetting that you were purged from your old sins, give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you, and this is the key word, abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, here's the thing. There's getting into heaven, and then there's getting in abundantly. You know, and, and John, in the book of John, it tells us, you know, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So when he talks here about entering into the kingdom of God abundantly or richly or with abundance or riches, what he's talking about is laying up treasure in heaven. You know, I need to remember that I was purged from my old sins, that Christ came to save me from my sins, and I need to take up the cross and deny self and follow Christ. You see how that person, they're thinking about heaven, they've got the treasures in heaven, and if you do that, man, you're going to be given an abundant entrance. It doesn't say, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you into the everlasting kingdom. It says, so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we are not talking about getting into heaven. We're talking about being rich in heaven. We're talking about entering abundantly into heaven. Now people will twist this scripture to try to say that this is just talking about getting into heaven. What they're saying is, boy, you need to make sure and be diligent and do all the work we just talked about, work hard, have all this virtue, patience, you know, temperance, all those things. And if you work hard and do all that, then you'll be sure that you're saved. Folks, that's garbage, that's work salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. See, this is not talking to an unsaved person, tell them, hey, here's how you're gonna make sure you're gonna get saved. You got to do all this work. Folks, that would deny the message of Christ all throughout the book of John telling us how to be saved, that it's by believing, it's by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
You see, they're looking at the calling and the election, and they're saying, oh, that's talking about getting saved. But wait a minute. That's not the calling we're talking about. Get the context, folks. The calling is that he called us to glory and virtue in this life. So don't let the Calvinists try to use this verse to try to say, hey, you don't know if you're going to heaven unless you do a bunch of work. Keep giving diligence. Keep working on it. Boy, that's not the gospel. 